Hi, everybody. A very warm welcome to our third and final Community Matters Ask Me Anything session. For those of you who weren't able to dial in over the past couple of weeks, I'll just give a very quick recap of why, in our opinion, Community Matters more than anything else in 2021. So research has shown that not only do communities deliver a huge ROI when compared to other marketing channels, but the value that they create increases with each year that they're active as well. So community has been coming up more and more in our conversations over recent months, but many of the merchants that we're talking to are finding it really hard to move from an unengaged customer base to a community of customers who are actively participating both with the brand and actually with each other as well. So with this in mind, we undertook some consumer research to find out exactly how many consumers are likely to undertake the community-based actions that are really valuable for their favorite brands, and also what would make them more inclined to join communities and behave in a more community-minded way. The result of this research was our community matrix, which shows that within your own customer community, there are likely to be different types of shoppers. You will have your drifters, you'll have lurkers, you'll have supporters, and at the very top, you'll have your insiders. Each of these profiles will be of differing levels of value to your brand, but you want to make as many of them as possible, those insiders. I won't go into too much more detail as we've got lots to cover today, but if you haven't already, then don't forget to have a quick read of our Community Matters magazine, which digs into those profiles in a bit more detail. Also gives you a ton of insight into how to get your customers to actually undertake the community-based actions and some examples thrown in there as well. So to help us understand more about community, we have three fantastic speakers here today. I'm excited to introduce Casey Armstrong from ShipBob, Amy Lightfoot from We Make Websites, and Oliver Galang from Shoelace. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. Third and final webinar, save the best till last. And perhaps we could start with just a quick intro from each of you. And for a bit of fun, I'd love to if you could tell us about any brand communities that you're actually currently a part of or enjoying seeing value from at the moment. I have to say, I was thinking about this. I've asked every speaker. And I'm not part of any brand communities myself, which is terrible. Obviously, there are ones that I really follow for work, but um, I need to find some to join because I feel like I'm missing out now that I've heard so many cool ones. Um, so, Oliver, could you kick us off? Quick intro and a brand community that you're part of. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Oliver. I'm a senior account strategist at Shoelace, um, where we focus on paid socials specifically for direct-to-consumer e-commerce clients. I think um, I'm kind of similar, actually. I don't I don't have any particular brand communities. I would say I'm a part of, um, although I'm quite addicted to TikTok right now, and I'm on Fit Talk, which has been a lot of Nike and Gymshark. So I guess I'm on my way to be part a part of the Gymshark community. Um, that's a big one, to be fair. Huge, that's <laughs> massive. Yeah, they've done a good job. To and I think there's many places you can be part of that. So TikTok is, is <laughs> I'd say you qualify. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> the reassurance that I qualify there. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Casey, over to you. Quick intro and uh, a brand community that you're part of. Yeah, Casey Armstrong. Um, I'm calling in from Southern California, um, CMO over at ShipBob. Uh, we're a, are a, a global e-commerce fulfillment provider. Um, from a community perspective, I'm, I'm part of a, a group called Polymathic, which is run by 2PM um, that covers really all things across the, the spectrum in, uh, in e-commerce. I, I don't use TikTok, but I, I've actually leveraged Twitter, I'd say, um, in a way that's kind of benefited me quite a bit. Um, and I think that's just another area where it's just this like broader community and a bunch of niches within uh, and then actually uh, a, a while ago, I used to run a company called or helped run a company called Paleo Hacks, which was a paleo community. And so uh, happy to share what went well and what did not go well there as well. But like you said, community can be just extremely powerful. And that was really the heart of the entire business. Fantastic. But paleo would be an interesting one because actually there's quite a lot of advice out there, but I wouldn't trust a lot of it. You, you can read two completely differing reports on what what is and what isn't paleo in 10 seconds on the internet so or anything in life i feel like uh, <laughs> you have the internet and it's like you should maybe breathe and like really water is the only thing that hasn't been completely ostracized so we'll, we'll see even water you can drink too much of it apparently yeah. which is dangerous <laughs> it's amazing thank you and amy over to you Hi, um, I'm Amy. I work at a I work in product management at a company called We Make Websites, which is, as I always say, exactly what's on the tin. We make websites. <laughs> um, they're e-commerce um, websites based on Shopify. So I work across yeah, a variety of clients, which means that 
I'm sure I'll spend most of the webinar saying the answer to the question being, it kind of, it depends. Because <laughs> <laughs> I have a variety of clients for whom um, their needs are obviously like totally different. Um, in terms of brand community, I have a completely irresponsible book purchasing habit, both um, secondhand and uh, new, and uh, have in no way been converted to eBooks. And so I have a stamp card for just so many bookshops that I can't get to soon. Um, the closest one is Brighton, which I live in London, so not close. But I also have one for a francophone bookstore in Ottawa in Canada, which is also very far away. So I'm like weirdly part of all these like little book communities that I can't actually reach very well. So. Oh, but great to know that community travels, you know, you can be part of a community without being local, which is very good for people to know. I happen to be in Brighton. So just let me know what you want me to pick up and I'll get it sent over. Deprive me a visit to your city. How dare you? Good point. But good point. Nice to get the train down, go for, you know, go for a little outing. <laughs> And you can introduce me to the bookshop and I'll join their community. Perfect. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, big thank you again for all being here. Um, we'll get going with our questions. We've had some really good ones submitted ahead of time. But remember, if something comes to mind during the session, you can drop it into the Zoom Q&A and we'll do our best to tackle it within the session. And if we don't get to it, then we will include it in our follow up content as well. So get going. Ask as many questions as you like. So for our first question, this one comes from Neil. First of all, you need to obviously understand your community and who's who within it. So Neil would like to know, what advice can you offer in terms of gathering the data that you need to identify the different personas within your community? So I think, you know, this is a great question. It's getting harder and harder to gather first party data. Community is a really good way of doing it. So um, open up to the floor. What advice can you offer in terms of gathering the data you need to identify different personas within your community? Does anybody want to kick us off? Sure, happy to. Um, I think just as a starting point, as you said, it, it's getting harder, particularly those of us on this side of the ocean with GDPR and various other changes. It's and of course, like the changes Google Chrome is bringing in, it is it is harder and harder to um, to get data on people, which you know mixed blessing. <laughs> and so, I think the starting point for me is always just that like raw data, like how often are they buying? Um, are they coming back? Are they buying the same things? If you have subscriptions, like. Are they buying the same product or are they subscribing? So really just starting from that key point of like, what are they buying and what is their like frequency, average order value? So I think just starting with that, like almost just raw data, I think is a great starting point. So get as much as you can without them having to give it to you themselves and, and, and share information. Everything. Look at what you've already got. Interesting. Anything else to add to that? I can jump in here, just expanding on uh, the regulations and, and things like that and making it it's, uh, becoming more difficult on, on gathering that data. I would recommend everyone just download their, their data, um, especially the ones on Facebook and Instagram with uh, Facebook and Instagram analytics going away. Uh, just if you've run social either organically or uh, on paid, uh, definitely try and secure that data that you have now before it goes away and you don't have it anymore. Um, so that would be my recommendation just because, uh, you, you get a ton of data from the platforms that you advertise on. Um, and sometimes the platforms provide you with a lot of information and that, that could help you, um, craft these, uh, different cohorts of these different audiences and help you understand those things. But yeah, it, it is getting harder and is getting more difficult to so download it before it goes away. That's great advice. I hope someone on my team is listening. <laughs> Something as well. Again, it depends on, I guess, how people join your community and, and where you're hosting it. So, for example, with like Paleo Hacks, we hosted it on a custom solution that we built. And people could sign either with their email or through a handful of just different single sign-on tools like mm -hmm. Google and Facebook. And there's just so much demographic data you can get there. Even with email, there's still a lot of tools out there like Clearbit and others where you can, you can enrich the data um, to get a lot of information and start carving it up. But I think what's equally valuable. I know what we're talking about a lot is just export the data and slice it up to really understand like maybe location, age, gender, and stuff like that. But it's also just, you know, re reading through what is, you know, what are the most upvoted topics? What are people discussing most often? And what is like the real role of the community? And so there's a customer of ours who we, we actually had on our operator series the other week. 
and um, what he sells, it's, it's like a coffee alternative. And he was talking about how the community is what, what really helped help him grow and grow effectively, especially as like CPMs and CPAs and everything on Facebook and Google continue to jump up. And I was like, well, what is the community? Are people just talking about your drink? Like, why are people coming back? And he's like, it's really about all these, you know, productivity hackers. And it's, it's almost like he didn't mention, you know, four hour work week, but it's like, you know, these four hour work week type people that are trying to always find ways to, to short the system. And so it's really understanding like, what is, what is the job to be done and, and what are people coming back for? Um, and productivity, I mean, that doesn't surprise me. Just look at how many new productivity tools get funded every single day and there's no one right answer. And, and that's similar to what we had at Paleo Hacks, which was like, what is, why are people actually coming back? And a lot of it was honestly signaling where they wanted to be able to tell their friends that they tried the latest cool paleo recipe with whatever bacon wrapped Twinkies or something like that. I don't know, but it was, it was, it was a lot of like, it was, it was just a lot of that, that signaling aspect. And so it was okay. You know, that really helped feed us into what are the things we should help from our blog or our podcast or seeding the community with to really drive a lot of discussion. Just to jump on that too, actually, um, a lot of people forget to check the comment section of their ads. They kind of, you know, they follow up on their organic content, but they, they forget that their ads also live and people comment on them and people discuss things, right? So make sure to check up on those things and then just be, be part of the conversation, right? See what people are talking about, answer questions, you know, be part of that discussion and that's going to help you understand them a little bit better. Um, another thing too, is if you're active on multiple social media platforms, like just even just understanding the types of communities on those social media platforms, whether you're on Snapchat or on TikTok or on Reddit, like understand the type of people or the types of communities that get built up on those specific platforms. And when you're putting content out there and who's engaging with those things. And as Casey said, what's being upvoted, right? Like that gives you a bit more understanding on, uh, on, on your different audiences as well. Definitely. And I think, oh, sorry. Okay. I just think building on that, um, there is a sense of uh, with different platforms, sometimes people forget which social platform, forget about maybe like less, less frequently used social platforms. So um, I previously worked for an academic startup and there were times where actually there was quite a lot going on on Pinterest, which is maybe not where you would expect scientific research to be shared. Um, peer-reviewed scientific research to be shared wow. and there was a surprising amount of that but I guess like that was outside of the mold of how you, people were thinking about published research and so I think really making sure you're investing in investigating different fa- like different communities that and not assuming that your communities will be in one particular space. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And this is great, actually, because it leads on to our second question from Rob, which was, in fact, if you've got different cohorts in your community, should you develop different strategies for each cohort? And it sounds very much as though we're saying, yes, if you've got people on different social channels. So, for I mean, take someone like um, Decathlon, you know, they cover every sport in the world. So they must have multiple cohorts and subsections of people who like different sports who might also be different uh, demographics in terms of age or location. So they're going to engage with different social channels, etc. So, uh, yeah, it, it sounds very much as though you guys are saying, yes, it, you do need to sort of um, develop different strategies for each of your community cohorts, or at least understand where they are and where they're operating. I'm going to not necessarily agree because I think it depends on uh, I think it depends on the bandwidth of the team. Like there's just so many channels that people can focus on. And I've worked at a few companies, including Shifab, where we've purposely avoided certain parts of the Internet at times um, just from like a prioritization standpoint. Well, mm-hmm. there might be some conversation like you're not going dis- to you're not going to maybe disregard certain people or or necessarily overly avoid them but you there's only so much time in the day and you need to spend your time most wisely and so i think it's just really prioritizing like in in amy's example if if a lot of organic conversations are happening on pinterest and it's worth their time then that's probably a great use of time are people posting stuff on pinterest in our world maybe but is that the best spot for us to focus on no and so, again, I think it's just it's really prioritizing. And if you have to ignore everything except for one channel, then then do that. Like not every brand should be on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok. 
Like there, maybe there's just one that you want to go in, all in on and then expand from there. Maybe it's TikTok, and then you start reusing a lot of that on Instagram. Um, but again, I think it's just really under like figuring out early, like where do you think your customers are spending the most time and spending a lot of time there? Same thing with Reddit. Like some people should just spend all their time focusing on building that community in Reddit and some should actively avoid ever opening up Reddit because <laughs> they just wasted six hours of their six hours of their lives. And so and you really can, you can get lost in Reddit very quickly. <laughs> and I think building, building on that a little bit is there are, I think there are fine, of course, there are fine hours of the day, particularly if you have a smaller team. So we have like when we're building websites or maintaining them for different clients, there are some people who are just a, a two person operation and coming into them and saying, like, hey, you need to do a new loyalty scheme. Do you have 30 hours a week to work <laughs> on it? Like it's just totally unreasonable. And so I think understanding the range and what people really have time for and I imagine most people would agree that like a strong um, investment in one area is so much better than like a light, not super great <laughs> disparate strategy across the board. And like, I guess to Casey's point, like I have a client that huge amount of their traffic comes through Instagram and they have no reason to ever be on Reddit. Like I would never, ever recommend that because it's just, just a, not good for them or just kind of a waste of time. So I think you need to value the time people are spending on this and like recognize that it is time consuming. hundred percent. And just to add that from the paid social side of things, like you'd rather do like one platform really great and focus on the one that drives in the most amount of return on investment or just like overall return on ad spend first before venturing into the other platforms. And especially on the paid social side of things, like some of your strategies of what works on audiences and targeting can, can work cross-platform. Some of the stuff that works on Facebook and Instagram in terms of the way you manage your account structure and in the way that you manage your targeting can also work on Pinterest. But obviously be successful in one place before just trying to spare yourself too thin. Um, a lot of times the platforms work really well when you invest the money into them, of course, and that, that's what they'll tell you too. Um, but the more data that you get, the better that you'll be able to make decisions on and the more efficient that you'll be able to make your advertising. Um, and I'd rather you spend like, Five thousand, ten thousand dollars on one platform to figure out if that works for you, rather than spending a thousand dollars across the board and not knowing where to go from there. That's yeah, pretty good advice, and I think it's very interesting. Less about um, different strategies for different cohorts, but more figuring out who your most valuable cohort is and doubling down there. That makes a lot of sense. And um, Amy, this question I think is specifically for you. Um, when it comes to reaching your community on site, how do you promote a lo your community throughout the site and keep it on brand so that your community is always getting that consistent experience? Yeah, I, I think, as I said in my intro, my response to a lot of things is it varies. Okay. And so I think when you're thinking about on-site branding, especially, you really need to have a good sense of your brand identity. So as I work with a variety of different um, clients, it's always good to understand, okay, well, is your... Um, is your loyalty scheme more exclusive? Are you going for those like hype brand secret drops or are you going for um, like a wider community base? And I think until you know that, you're essentially just throwing, <laughs> throwing money out into the universe. And so I think once you figure out and nail down your brand identity, then the way you display it on the platform makes a huge difference. So we have some brands that, as I said, sort of want to do those like exclusive product drops. You're going to want to um, put content behind a wall um, and have people get sent out like the secret code 12 hours sooner. And that brand is very consistent across the board, across the site. It, it's treated as this like exclusive thing that you can opt into. Whereas for other clients that want to do more like a community-based loyalty system, they'll have, um, or I guess like a more broad loyalty system, they'll maybe have things directly on the product page. Like you can get X amount of points, you can get returns for this sort of thing. So the way you display your offering, and actually, in a lot of ways, the offering itself varies so much based on your brand identity. And it's interesting because brand identity has sort of been expanded over the past few years where people are starting to shop more consciously with brands that they have something in common with. Um, so that brand identity is not just about your products anymore. It's about what you stand for as a brand and what you value as a brand. And was, it's interesting seeing how people are bringing that out in their loyalty programs as well at the moment. You know, custom rewards, things like um, if you recycle your packaging, you get additional points where you can 
instead of claiming a, a reward you can donate your reward to a dog shelter you know things like that so I think um yeah what your brand, brand identity is is potentially evolved over time as yeah, well. it has a huge impact as you said in the offering um of the actual reward itself so there are a lot of like customers or clients moving towards setting up yet yeah, that sort of you can donate the equivalent of this do you want to offset the carbon footprint of your delivery mm-hmm. like there's that kind of thing that people are pulling through in terms of like offering and the ability to, I guess, share additionally, the ability to share that, that, that step that they've taken is obviously really has been really successful. So you, you're checking out, you want to announce that you gave a certain amount to the Battersea dog shelter You just put that on Twitter and then you mm-hmm. kind of get the two for one, you get to, you get a, a good feeling. And then also you've shared into the universe that, um, that you've done that. Yeah, and you get some of that influencer status that Katie oh, yeah. was mentioning earlier as well. Brilliant. Thanks, Amy. Um, our next question is from Harvey, and he would like to know, thinking more about off-site, what's the best way to promote your community to people who haven't joined it yet or people who don't know about it yet? Anybody want to take the lead on that one? I can I can kind of jump in here. So offsite, so um, not on the website, but again, coming from a paid social um, perspective here, I think the best way to promote your community or promote your loyalty programs is through retargeting. Um, retarget the people that haven't joined your loyalty programs, but perhaps have shown interest or perhaps even purchase something. A lot of times we'll set up a past purchaser campaign for recent purchasers to join the community. And that's the only goal of that campaign. And that actually still nets us a positive return on ad spend. So not just focusing in on trying to get people to continue buying, you can use paid social as a strategy to grow your community as long as you're targeting the right audiences, right? And you're using it in the appropriate places. Um, so that's, that's one little thing. Definitely. I mean, those people are slightly warmer than your completely cold audience, aren't they? So much easier to convert in theory. Casey or Amy, anything to add there? Uh, maybe just thinking through, like, what are your what are your customers doing already to promote the brand if they are? Um, maybe utilizing your website to put that front and center, which I know a lot of companies will do. Um, and then I think that can just kind of subtly incentivize more of the community or more of your customers to jump on that as well. And, you know, that's what gets the most reach is just that organic reach that people are posting again, whether that be on Instagram or Facebook or TikTok or something like that. And so you're just kind of giving them that additional nudge, which will get you, you know, more reach and hopefully bring people more in. Um, I, 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 again, there's, there's some brands, I'll try to pull up a couple of examples that just do that extremely well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just, you know, how do you maybe turn that into a community in itself? You know, if you're selling outdoor wear, you know, are there hiking communities that are popping up in different areas? Uh, there's just a lot of good examples that the brands put out there. Um, and again, I think it's just trying to give them those, those subtle nudges or without being too involved, maybe helping form those communities in different pockets as well. I think expanding on that actually is taking that content that's being crafted by the community and, and turning it into an advertisement. Um, user generated content is working really well. Um, working with influencers is working really well. And just reaching out to your community and asking them like, hey, I, I really like this video that you guys posted about our brand or about our product. Can we, can we use it in our paid media, right? Maybe, maybe paying them here and there for specific influencers. But sometimes just a lot of our brands like just go out and ask and people are more than happy to just be there and be part of the community and, uh, you know, and people like seeing their faces promoting, you know, they tell their friends, uh, you know, like, Hey, you know, I'm in that advertisement. Right. So that's, that's fun for them too. But again, it's just that collaboration with like, Hey, you know what? We appreciate you guys like contributing to this community. Like we're going to put in return, like you're going to boost your pages and boost your yourself here as well. Um, and it works really, really well right now. It's probably our top performing creatives right now. I can believe it. It's funny. I was um, look, at, look at you. Look at GoPro. I know that they've had their ups and downs, and and they really took off well before a lot of social media went crazy. Yeah. Um, but they did such a good job of that, where the product itself was built in for self promotion. And again, mm-hmm. this is before you could easily get it onto a bunch of different social channels. And I think they've made some maybe missteps, but also made some great decisions as well. But just always featuring that user generated content. And mm-hmm. people wanted a GoPro 
just so that they could showcase themselves and like look awesome, whether they were hiking or surfing or, or skiing or something like that. Uh, so that's, that's a, another brand where I think there's a lot of things that can just be taken from them and, and recycled. Mm-hmm. I think I mentioned Gymshark was doing really well on TikTok. Sorry, Amy, but uh, yeah, Gymshark's been doing really well on TikTok. We just like have, like, I think they're like number two on fitness TikTok in terms of just like mentions for their brand. And that's just them working with their community and just like people are just tagging them and just wearing their their gear, right? I I haven't seen a single Gymshark ad, but I feel like I'm getting Gymshark advertisements right now. I think sort of building on um, what Casey and Oliver are both saying, One of the mistakes I think a lot of brands make is when they make that, when they reach out even to someone who might be like a potential member of their community, they reach out because they want you to buy something. Mm -hmm. And that is an immediate, like it, for a lot of people, that's an immediate turnoff. If like the next point of contact I have from you is like, come buy something. (laughs) I, I just, it doesn't incentivize me and it makes your, it can make your brand feel like very cold. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we found for one of my clients who are a book publisher, they have uh, quite a large like area of um, free reads and sort of more community-based stuff. And so when you do have that sort of abandoned basket or when you're doing that like previous purchase or follow-up, drawing people into the like the free reads means they're now they're on your platform. Like now they're on your website and it's one tab over to go buy something. And so I think when you're pulling people from offsite, you really just want people back. You just want to just pull people back to your site, but not yeah, under the guise of buying something is a bit, you know, gives off a bit of a bad vibe. People are like, come back and buy something. Yeah. <laughs> On the ad side of thing, you'll see this happen all the time. Like, hey, I just bought those pair of leggings. Like, stop showing me the same pair of leggings over and over and over again. I'm like, why why like stop that advertisement? Right? Yeah, that, that is infuriating. Hundred <laughs> percent, right? And you'll see that across the board all the time. So that's definitely a common mistake as well. And yeah, I've had that with them, more luxury brands as well. Like, look, I'm going to buy one Le Creuset thing this week. I'm not buying a <laughs> second one. I don't know who's out here with that budget. It's not me. Like, yeah. Please, please better target your ads. It <laughs> happens all the time on Amazon too, right? Like you, you buy one toaster. Yeah. Now Amazon thinks that you're just like a toaster fanatic and uh, you just want toasters all the time. Oliver, that's very hurtful because I'm a toaster collector. And I, I, I am the use case that <laughs> that's for. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a while for reasons that are not clear to me based on the Amazon algorithm. I promise this is irrelevant. It's not. I kept getting advertisements, like recommendations for like Peter Andre's album and like okay. various other like album. that might be that might be a joke for the UK audience. But like just someone I would whose music I would never ever buy, but I must have clicked on something like two years ago. I think we just learned a lot about you. <laughs> <laughs> One of my finest qualities. I like to talk about myself. <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> no, I think, yeah, really good points. And it's, it's interesting as well, something like GoPro, I mean, their content, it, 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 it's, um, the UGC is made for that. It's fantastic. Whereas if, you, um, if you're selling something like, uh, I don't know, washing up liquid, you're going to have a bit more of a challenge, but there's still really innovative things you could do. You know, you could have all these competitions, like whose kids could do the coolest thing with that washing up bottle. And then my nieces would love to do something like some kind of craft project with it. So there's, there's multiple ways of getting that sort of EGC and contact in between transactions, even if you're selling the most boring product in the world, I think just need a bit of imagination. Um, Oliver, coming back to you, what are the most common mistakes that you see people making when it comes to targeting and media buying for their actual communities online? Uh, just yeah just expanding on that point we just talked about like you, you're a lot of your top of funnel or your prospecting advertisements are like hi nice to meet you i'm this brand like you should buy this product but then after they buy the product it's a continual bombardment of hi nice to meet you and you keep talking to them like it's the first time that they're seeing your brand and if you continue to have that type of conversation they're they're no longer going to want to see your content because it no longer speaks to them because now they're someone that owns your product, but you're talking to them like they have no idea what your product is, right? You're trying to convince them why they should buy your product, but they already own it, right? So there's a misalignment in what the customer wants out of their content and what you're trying to advertise for them. So on the targeting side of things, it's just making sure you have proper exclusions. And obviously with iOS 14.5, it's becoming more difficult to set up those exclusions 
But still having them set up is really, really important. And having separate campaigns and account structure that allows you to target specifically people that have never experienced your brand or never bought from you from the people that have been to your website or have seen this video or have seen this content or have bought your product or bought multiple products and making sure that the message that you're sending to those audiences are the correct ones, right? And you're having the appropriate content for them. So I think that's the common mistake that we see a lot of people that are coming to us and we're checking out their Facebook ads accounts and we're auditing them. And then certain things are just not excluded, right? They think they're doing a top of funnel campaign, but all of their past purchasers are still included in that campaign, right? Um, so that's definitely, uh, the, I think, the number one mistake. And I think uh, the second mistake that we're seeing across the board is just making assumptions, too many assumptions when you venture into a platform um, of who you want to be targeting. And oftentimes what we're seeing that works better is just starting off really broad and spending the money and seeing where your creatives take you and letting your creatives do the targeting for you, as opposed to just trying to be super laser targeted, which in all honesty worked a long time ago when the algorithm sucked a lot. And, um, but the algorithms are a little bit better now and do a pretty good job of trying to figure out who it should be sent out to. And it's a lot better to start off broad and then work from there based off of that, that data instead of going super laser targeted and, um, right off the bat because you don't learn a whole lot from there. So that's what I would say. Can I, can I jump into the question for Oliver? Yeah, so, go for it, Casey. So I know that the iOS, you know, Facebook updates made a lot of news, you know, whether it's a, a story or non-story. Um, I, I've heard about it a lot from our merchants. Um, what's been, maybe if you can just give the audience, cause I'm sure a lot of the audience is like nodding their head and is like, yes, tell us more. Um, <laughs> what is, maybe just give us a high level of like what that change actually did. And then from what you guys are seeing, cause you guys have visibility into hundreds of, of accounts, Correct. like what, what have been the biggest impacts and maybe how companies are um, evolving their approach in like this new world. Yeah, for sure. I think that the, what's, what's happening right now is the, the biggest impact is the loss of data that Facebook and Instagram are able to obtain from our customers. And for us on the, as, as media buyers, like we no longer can just solely trust your return on ad spend numbers or your CPA numbers or even your purchase revenue from Facebook and Instagram. It's no longer as one-to-one -one as it was before. And also our attribution windows are a lot smaller, whereas some merchants used to be able to track like 28 day attribution and attribute clicks to purchases from over 28 days ago, but that's no longer the case and that's been limited to seven. There's obviously a lot more technical stuff, but that's kind of like the biggest impact ones right off the bat. Um, and in saying that the way a lot of our merchants are adjusting is no longer just solely looking at Facebook and Instagram return on ad spend, but looking at their overall MER or just like their overall return on ad spend across omni-channel, just whether or not they increase ad spend on whatever platforms and if the revenue increased overall. So it's a lot more analysis across the board and a lot more assumptions that need to be made but also just like there's less, less trust in the data that you're getting from Facebook and Instagram. So I think that's been kind of the biggest pivot is that, well, you know, your previous Facebook and Instagram targets for return as spend could have been say 4X full funnel. And now it's seeing 2X, but your revenue stayed the same and you haven't changed much, right? So do you stop spending on Facebook and Instagram because your ROAS numbers are down or do you adjust your targets or, and do you adjust how you look at the data and how you make your decisions? When does Apple buy Snapchat since they just booted <laughs> Facebook from the, from the app store pretty much? <laughs> that that's it's so funny because that's what's happening on the twitter space right now actually just all these conversations that apple's really just doing this to control their own platform and that you're going to start to see apple search specialists at one point as well right so i mean maybe the next webinar i'm talking about apple advertising and how to take advantage of that for our merchants um but for now i'm not i'm not entirely sure where that's going <laughs> I might have to stay clear of that one, go over my head. <laughs> so it is interesting though, and we've had a lot of conversations with our merchants about 
yeah, do you keep investing in that or do you switch your focus to things that you can measure more tangibly? Also, people are talking very much about, or do I, and this ties into the community point, I guess, but do I move away from the product ads and do more kind of billboard, big brand advertising and try and just get a more general message out there, which um, I guess would be a good way to promote your your community or some of that UGC that we've just been talking about. Um, But yeah, there's some tough decisions for people to make, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest thing to think about too is that just like whoever you're working with, whether that's your in-house team or if it's an agency or if it's a consultant and you're seeing results just drop across the board, it's honestly probably not their fault. And obviously (laughs) this is coming from a very biased opinion as someone that works on that side. Um, But uh, yeah, there's just a lot of changes going on right now. And honestly, like there's no solution right now. We're so early in the in the in in what's happening right now. So if you there's honestly a lot of advertisements that I've been getting them of like here's the secret sauce or here's to solve the the problem that Apple's introducing right now or get all of your data back. So I would definitely say ignore all of those things because they're all lying. Um, and everyone is just testing and experimenting. And honestly, a lot of the new tactics that work right now are things that we're all trying. Things that we used to do before where it's like, hey, let's take a look at Google Analytics data and let that be our driving decision maker. Let's not rely on ROAS and take a look at CTR or maybe some high um, upper funnel metrics to decide whether or not we kill an ad. I think the biggest thing to do right now is just be more patient with your decisions. You know, um, There's a little bit of delayed attribution right now, whether or not you got that purchase from a Facebook or Instagram ad. And just being a little bit more patient with that can help um before you know killing something and then seeing your revenue drop and you're you're not knowing why so just building on that because i um well i'm not quite on your side of um your side of the universe oliver i am um very much conscious when uh, when analytics drop <laughs> <We're> <laughs> worried and so i would just say adding on to the apple changes we're also seeing like huge changes with core web vitals so mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff that's coming out this summer really is going to is going to have a huge impact, particularly on organic traffic, and so that's something that I would really encourage anyone who's looking to bolster their community work to really look into and um, consider how that's going to impact. Because if a lot of the way they're um, they're grabbing members of the community is based on that like organic search, so if people are looking up, a, I don't know, like workout leggings, <laughs> and they're getting <laughs> Gymshark at the top, like. If, if you haven't adjusted for core web vitals, like maybe another brand will be coming up above you and then you're going to be losing that, that turnaround on it. So I would say, um, just, yeah, just building on the stuff that's happening with Facebook and with iOS, like really staying appraised of those changes in the landscape are going to make a huge difference for any, any community you're building. Absolutely. And also in the same vein, watch out for people trying to sell you an instant fix there as well, because we've had the golden age of SEO. We've all been missed too. <laughs> uh, and then, oh. Uh, Just one last thing on this topic. I want to give out some technical advice of what we're seeing work across the board during this time. Um, So for the people that are actively media buying, if you're you're here and you're listening to this call, um, we're seeing higher percent lookalike audiences work better. So everything above 3% or even up to 10% are working better than our 1% audiences. Our non-pixel-based lookalike audiences are doing better. The ones that are based off of Facebook data. So things like save posts look like audiences or video viewers look like audiences because technically that data isn't affected. It's a lot of our pixel data. Um, broader audiences continue to perform better than our hyper-targeted ones. Um, and just stacking audiences and consolidating your account structure is doing a lot better. With the data loss, obviously, audiences are a lot smaller. So putting things together, looking at further look-back windows. So instead of maybe add to cart last seven days, you're looking at maybe last 30. We've even seen some success with like last 180 of just throwing them all in there, what we're able to get, right? And we're seeing some success there. But obviously, this is just anecdotal from the hundreds of stores that we're working on. So take that with a grain of salt. This might work for your store. It might not work, but they're all worth a test at the end of the day. Perfect. Lovely insight. Thank you very much, Oliver. And Casey, I think our next question is best suited for you. Obviously, um, 
it doesn't just stop online. You're still reaching your community even once they've bought and their products arriving. So what would you say the number one thing you can do from a shipping perspective to boost insider engagement is? Yeah, so, I mean, one of the things that, that we see a lot of our customers do is, and why they work with us is because they can continue to own all of that customer data and they can also provide um, a very custom unboxing experience. Um, and they also can, you know, work with us to control what is the experience that the customers are getting. Are they ordering something and it's taking them forever? Or are they actually getting in that one, two, three, four days, whatever it is that the brand promises? And so uh, a good example there is the customer we work with called uh, Your Super, who I'm also a customer of as, of as well. You know, when you order from them, you get your package in a couple of days. It's this custom box. You open it up. It's this nice presentation, but also they'll include things like inserts of like, so they have these, um, it's a lot of the like health food and like greens. And so they've got this new one. It's called like, uh, I forget what it's called exactly, but it's something to, it's, it helps like with your gut. And so they'll give you this, you know, custom insert for you that is, based off of like, here's your schedule to like track you actually using this and here's some improvements and hey, here's some um, different uh, smoothies and, and foods that you can make with it. Uh, and then it also will lead into just um, highlighting the different communities that they have online as well that people can jump into because that's often where people will go to, you know, share different recipe ideas or, hey, I'm, I'm allergic to X, so I can't use this idea do you have any other suggestions? And so again, I think it's thinking through, you, you've got this person, where, where do you get, you know, 100% open rate that's in the packages that you ship to them. And so mm -hmm. leveraging that as most effectively as possible. 100%. And, and as you say, that's the thing people share, isn't it? When you, I mean, you, you can share it online for lots of different reasons. It might just be that it's really beautiful. I've seen people sort of taking pictures of the packages that arrive just because they look so great or they just got such awesome sort of bits and pieces in there, as you say. But then there's also... The kind of ongoing engagement going back online and you know it might be you could put some kind of hashtag in there where if it's a certain product get everybody who's using it to sort of talk about it in the same way online definitely so that's making me want to go shopping now i want to get some deliveries <laughs> it's the best part <laughs> to, to jump on that i actually to, to take take that content and then use that in your advertisement mm -hmm. Oh. ocean of the unboxing hire an influencer make a user generated content of someone just unboxing it you know take those videos and then target the people that haven't purchased but have maybe been to your website or have looked at your ads already right show them like hey you already showed them the product right show them if they take it a little bit step further what their experience will be like if they get it to their door Right. So like not every piece of creative needs to be like a professional product, like a flat lay image of your photo of your products. Um, you know, it, it could be just as simple as like taking this little thing that you find like, hey, you know what? Like our unboxing experience is really great. Mm -hmm. Showcase that people want to see that. And that's what's going to convince people to, to buy your product. And then talk about that shipping experience. Free shipping drives so much conversions, right? So obviously the shipping experience is a big driver for whether or not people are going to purchase your product. So talk about that. Use that in your copy, right? And what we also found from the community research was free shipping was one of the things that would motivate people to join a community and in interact more with that community. So it's a very virtuous circle, really. Amazing. Um, next question. This is from several people. Um, we've had it actually have it several times over the three weeks as well. But if you were going to start a brand community tomorrow, what's the first thing you, you would do? Casey, you've already started one, so perhaps we can start with you. So that community really started, I mean, this is several years ago. Um, but the, the original founder of that, he was, he was in all of these different, um, you know, he was trying to solve the problem himself, mm -hmm. um, in the paleo space, he was getting a lot of migraines and thought it was from the food that he was eating. And so he was reading all these different blogs and, and then there are all these like conversations happening in like the blog comments back when people actually used to comment like non-spam in blogs. <laughs> um, and so he's like, why isn't there a place where this lives? Um, and this is before a lot of these now rather very successful people in the, in the broader paleo space and CrossFit space really had made a name for themselves. And so he recruited a lot of them to, well, he built the community himself and then he recruited them, a lot of them to join because they got to, you know, help others, uh, aggregate all, a lot of the comments and conversation in one place. They got to showcase 
um, you know, their knowledge in the space and then start to promote themselves as well, just because they're being uh, helpful, just like people will utilize uh, Twitter and other channels today. Um, and so again, it really depends, I think, on where is there a gap? I think just trying to like force something in there is is not going to work or force things onto like a specific platform. But like, what is, where is like there the path, path of least resistance and where is there like a gap in the market? Um, and then also is, and I guess this maybe contradicts slightly what I just said is just do it. Like just try, pick, pick a, um, you know, a medium that you want to host this on. Um, and then just get out there and try it because you can read a million blog posts or Twitter posts or whatnot and find just like we, we were joking about earlier with like health food uh, and water, you know, you read enough stuff, everything is dangerous for you. And so just it, you, you should do your research and be well informed in advance and understand that it's going to be a lot of work. Community is a lot of work, um, but just eventually just pull the trigger and do it because whatever you have in mind today, it's, it's going to evolve over time. And so just, again, start picking it up. I love that. You've got to start somewhere, haven't you? And it will evolve and it will grow. It doesn't have to be the all singing, dancing, finished product on day one at all. That's great advice. And um, Amy, what would you say first thing to do? I don't know. I feel like Casey maybe stole my answer. <laughs> <laughs> I do think, yeah, I, I do think um, starting from scratch, particularly starting small, as I said earlier, there are just a huge amount of limitations. I guess a lot of the places I've worked have been very small. And I think being kind of sounds a bit, sounds a bit like a hug, but being sort of emotionally generous with yourself, not, not setting these like ridiculous benchmarks, thinking you're going to have like the top notch community in the next couple of months. So just starting small, really setting a deliverable. I think setting those benchmarks from the start make things a lot easier. So just saying like, okay, I'm going to use, Facebook, and I'm going to try and get X amount of people in my group. And I'm going to try and get X amount of people in my group by this point. Obviously, that might be like a 2016 example of a community, <laughs> but that sort of thing. So I think starting small, being conscious of the actual time you have, and then setting benchmarks, because otherwise, you'll never know if things have worked. And it can be really easy to be like, oh, well, my community is failing. Well, I don't know. We have year on year growth. It's not huge, but like, happening yeah and you've got to celebrate those successes this is great because it actually ties into our next question from paula which was how do you start a community when you don't have a full-time team member or the resource to take it on so a great crossover here but i think um from my best perspective it would be sit down and look at the marketing that you're already doing you know and then look at how you can just build community into that so if you're sending these emails if you've got loyalty emails going out if you've got post-purchase emails going out don't, don't go up, come up with a whole new email strategy for your community. Just make sure you're building it into what you're already doing. If you believe that your community is going to really thrive on um, reviews, then make sure you're incentivizing those reviews and then you're using it to build up the community. And similarly, you know, if, you're, if you have a support team that are working hard and they're talking to people all day, get them to promote your community to people. So instead of looking at it as a whole new stream, it's probably more a case of, well, look at all of the activities you're doing and then see where you could fit a community into that. And that will help you grow it with a few resources, potentially. Well, also, especially if you're smaller, which I'm going to assume most of the people listening here have relatively smaller brands, is not something you just like hand off to somebody else. And so I think it's having like, proper expectations with yourself and like why are you trying to build the community is it because you view it as like cheap customer acquisition like i think that's the wrong approach people are going to sniff that out and then you're going to eventually just try to sell them, them the whole time you can't just outsource it to some you know freelancer you can't just do it like a little bit i think especially early on it's got to come from the founder like the founder or founders they have to like really care and want to build the community and be and, like invested in it themselves uh, and, and be part of it. Um, and if you don't, it's going to fail. So such a good point. And it's what consumers want as well from, you know, from the research we saw. I can't remember the exact numbers off the top of my head, but it was well over 60, 70%, I think, who would join a community so that they can interact with the brand itself and also so that they could hear the brand's history and hear the story behind it. So, you know, you, you set up your brand for a reason. You're passionate about something. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. So I think absolutely make sure it's, it's your voice that's carrying through in that community and that passion that you're sharing. And that should pay dividends in the end because that's what's going to keep people on the hook and keep people engaging. 
Yeah. And I mean, you look at, and again, you have to look at companies that think rel- like maybe just slight, like in the next stage of growth above you mm-hmm. and maybe what they did, you can't, it's so easy to look around and say, well, the Peloton CEO is not involved in the community. Well, they're not <laughs> Peloton. And yeah. so, and, and they have a different product. They've got their, um, all their instructors like in your living room or in your bedroom, like right in your face, teaching you. Um, and, and they all have their sub communities, which are part of like the bigger Peloton community. Mm. Um, and so, and, and, and that's a great place to be in, which is you build it up over time. And then you've got a bunch of advocates like throughout the company. Yeah. Um, again, it's, it's looking around, I'd, I'd say at companies that are more similar ish to you. And of course think big, but, but it's got to start somewhere. You can't just, you can't just hand it off. Definitely. And there's like, you know, you can look at someone, Sephora is almost my favorite example because it's the all singing or dancing in a beauty space. And it's taken them a long time to get there. They didn't get there overnight and you can app, but everything they're doing, there's a smaller, easier version that you could be doing. So, and yeah. I think having um, Casey's point about having the founder invo- founders involved makes such a huge difference. Um, you can really tell when when things are inauthentic. And obviously, it can be a bit of an ask to try and get your founders on webinars and <laughs> creating that kind of content. And there's a certain, I guess, like, it is an ask. But I think people can tell if someone isn't, like, in love with what they built. Like, you can really tell if if they're not invested at all. And it it. Inauthenticity is is obvious, <laughs> and particularly with social, like it becomes. I think it's even more obvious. Like whoever has just sort of funded something and then walked away. So I would say absolutely getting that like core, I guess the heart of the business involved makes such a big difference. It's interesting how you see content teams working with founders. I think so. I'm just thinking one one of my favorite. Uh, communities that we have at Loyalty Line is um, Astrid and Me. They're a jewelry brand, and they have quite a lot of content on their blog. That's um, it, it's their founders' voice and their founders' perspective, but it's an interview that one of their content marketers has done, etc. So it's taking up less time from that founder, but it's still still her voice getting put onto their channels and being shared as content. I, I think. think- yeah, I think part of the, uh, the the question is time, right? Like not having time. But if, if you're passionate about something, you're probably thinking about it all the time, right? You're thinking about it like when you're eating, you're, you're taking a shower, you, you're coming up with a bunch of different thoughts about, thoughts about it, right? And I think, um, you know, what's really great right now is technologies move so quickly that like you can record stuff just through your phone and it sounds great. I know that's contradictory to like my microphone setup right now on the webinar, but you can still sound amazing just recording through your phone. So just think about the thoughts that you have, the discussions that you have with people and turn that into content and contribute and provide value to the community. And then that's that's how you can get started and continue to do it without feeling like it's extra time out of your day to start building up that community. And I guess to that point about bringing in those like, I guess you didn't say small wins, but I'm going to use that (laughs) about bringing in those small wins. Like not everything has to be a huge campaign and not everything has to be a huge undertaking. So Eve, um, who works at We Make Websites, who's our uh, marketing and content executive, who's great. She put together something for International Women's Day and it wasn't, it, you know, this wasn't a 500 hour campaign, but it was good and it was nice. And it had photos of people from the company across different roles, different across different countries. And just that kind of like authentic engagement within the company. And obviously I'm very proud of We Make Websites that has a surprisingly strong gender balance for a tech company. And so that felt very true to our brand when it came, when it came around to that time. So I think, yeah, a lot of the time, I just sort of need a phone. <laughs> so <laughs> you can do a few small things that, that do make your brand more like welcoming. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And gives you the authenticity as well. Amazing. So we've got time for one more question. And I do want to squeeze this one in because it's been asked live and beforehand as well. So Maz would like to know, when it comes to community, is it better to keep things open and public or have it more exclusive invitation only style? Anybody got any thoughts on that? I chimed in asking just for context of like where they were thinking this would live. Cause I'm like, how would I guess it live if it was open? Um, so I guess any additional context there would be helpful. What's nice is if it's more closed is you're actually getting the people in, hopefully getting their email address and you can like continue that, that conversation. 
Also, depending on, again, the size, because like at, at Paleo Hacks, we eventually had to bring in a bunch of like power users to be moderators. And when you allow, we, we kind of went back and forth on people having to be signed in and not. When people can post anonymously, it can really drag down the conversation. And also you're mm-hmm. fighting a lot of spammers. And so if people actually are interested and in, in, in invested in your community and, and making it something, like for them to, to log in and be officially be a part of it is not a big ask. And so it's like, uh, I remember hosting events forever ago. Sometimes we'd, we'd have them for free because you wanted more people to come, but then you get all these people like the, what I call like the free pizza people. They just want to come <laughs> for the free pizza and they're really adding no value to the conversation where even if you just charge like a dollar, it weeds out a lot of the noise and the conversation and the value to everybody else who comes is that much better. And, and so I think similarly here, if they really care for them to like sign up and create an actual account, it's not much of an ask. And, and they should, they should have to do some type of payment, even if it's within the 30 seconds it takes for them to create the account. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it comes back to the value exchange again, doesn't it? You know, if it's your most valuable customers who are going to get a lot back from that community, then you might look at it being more exclusive so that they're really, they're getting something that they aspire to, but then everybody else sees them aspiring to it as well. Doesn't, that could be just a tier. That doesn't mean you can't have a more kind of open, um, open sphere on sort of different social channels and things. So perhaps it's a little bit of both, but um, I think I completely agree with you. If, if someone's really engaged with your brand, then it, it's not a big ask to create an account. I think the idea of tiers is nice, having a, an open place for people to just join in if they're interested, um, but having different gateways. Like we've got a lot of clients that have like VIP Facebook groups that you have to be a customer in to get into mm. and promoting products, seasonal launches, early access sales, those types of things do really, really well for those communities. So yeah. having that VIP, or as you said, the elite customers or loyal user group segmented, and mm-hmm. then being able to craft strategies for those segmented groups goes really well. Yeah. And you know, then you're, um, you're also investing a bit more time and effort in the people that are actually the most valuable to you as well. And you know, they're the people that it's worth doing a few extra events for, um, you know, launching products a little bit early for that kind of thing. So. Absolutely. And people just like to feel like, I mean, maybe this is, this is like a bit childish, but people do like to feel like they're getting something special. Mm-hmm. And so having that gate of content, having that like countdown, um, like just literally having a countdown banner <laughs> saying like, this is available early access for X people. Mm-hmm. Like, I, there's a lot of mailing lists I'd probably check myself on just to like, See what's on the wall. <laughs> it's not childish at all. It's like just being honest with ourselves of like what actually drives and motivates people. Like people are relatively simple at times. Um, and again, even thinking about what, what's best for the community. So another example would be this company called Lean Lux, um, which I'm sure is a newsletter a lot of us in the e-commerce space are familiar with. And so what Paul's done over there for his community is you need to be an active subscriber of his newsletter for a certain period of time. You need to be engaged with the newsletter for a certain period of time. And then that's what allows you to even apply to be in the community. Mm-hmm. And again, it sets this bar where if everybody gets in, then why is it special? Um, and, and I think that's, that's really important. Um, and then also once people do get into the community, they put in a little bit of work. And so they go out of their way. They don't want to get kicked out of the community um, and so they'll, they'll definitely come in and, and try to be as helpful as possible early on versus just, eh, whatever, I got into like my 19 million Slack group, like who cares? <laughs> um, you know, there's yeah. got to be something there that will bring you back. 100%. Yeah, you know, it's as important for the brand to be offering value. You, you're asking think people who are in these communities to do things for you. So you've got to be giving something back as well. Amazing. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Um, and that brings us to the end of our Community Matters Ask Me Anything sessions. I'm going to really miss doing these each week. And I'd like to say another really big thank you to our three speakers. It was great chatting to you. And thank you so much insight and expertise there. I have a lot to go away and think about. And I'm sure all of our listeners do too. Thank you also to everybody who submitted questions. If anything else comes to you down the line that you wish you'd asked, don't worry. You can still get in touch with us on social media via our website. We'll do our best to answer any questions that you have. 
So all that's left for me to say really is don't forget to have a good read of the Community Matters magazine if you haven't already and stay tuned for all the follow-up content where you'll see all the questions that have been asked across all three AMA sessions. Thank you again to our speakers and to everybody who dialed in. Really hope to see you all online again soon. Thanks so much. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.